The final conic that we look at is a specific type of hyperbola known as the rectangular hyperbola. And it's probably the hyperbola you're most used to seeing. Y equals 1 on X is a rectangular hyperbola. Basically, any hyperbola where the asymptotes are perpendicular to each other. So that's where it gets its name rectangular, because the asymptotes are at 90 degrees, 90 degrees being the angle in a, a rectangle. Well, if that's true, we know the slopes of the asymptotes are plus or minus B on A. And they must multiply together to give negative 1. So that basically tells us A is equal to B in a rectangular hyperbola. So therefore, it has the equation x squared on a squared minus y squared on a squared is equal to 1. Uh, we usually multiply by the a squared and, and don't worry about the fractions with the rectangular one. So just x squared minus y squared is equal to a squared. Now the eccentricity, remember for a hyperbola it was a squared plus b squared over a squared. But now it's going to be a squared plus a squared over a squared. So every rectangular hyperbola has an eccentricity of the square root of 2. Right. Now, I've seen that question a couple of times, actually, and people have wasted time, where they give you the equation of a rectangular hyperbola and say, oh, find its eccentricity. And of course, if you just remember this, you go, oh, well, rectangular hyperbola, eccentricity is the square root of 2. And then those that forget, obviously, go through all the working out and get the same answer, but waste a little bit of time. All right, so here is our hyperbola, rectangular hyperbola. Problem is, as I say, we're used to seeing it in that form, y equals 1 on x. How do we turn this curve into that curve? Well, we need to rotate it 45 degrees. Because those asymptotes, if b is equal to a, would become y equals x and y equals minus x. So if I could rotate those asymptotes 45 degrees, then they would become the coordinate axes and it's in the position that we're used to seeing. Now, if we had a technique of rotating points in the number plane, we could use that. This is where complex numbers comes in handy. Yeah. Because what I could now do is say, no, 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 this is not the number plane. This is the Argand diagram. And so that point xy is actually x plus iy. And I'm going to rotate it 45 degrees. Well, hang on. When we looked at complex numbers, remember rotation was multiplication by the cis of the angle we're rotating by. So I could rotate this by cis 45 degrees. Okay, so x plus iy multiplied by cos 45 plus i sine 45. And that is, of course, 1 on root 2 plus i, 1 on root 2. And if I expand it out, I get the coordinates of the new uh, uh, point would be, well, the x-coordinate would be the real part, x minus y over the square root of 2. And the uh, y-coordinate would be the imaginary part, x plus y over the square root of 2. Okay, so capital X, capital Y, so I don't confuse the two. It's now a parametric question. And then we say, well, what is the relationship between these two? We need to come up with an equation that relates the capital X, or capital Y. We've actually got two parameters here, a little x and a little y. How do we do it? Well, I'm going to multiply them together. Now... How did I work that out? Well, I kind of knew what the answer had to be. Because remember, y equals 1 on x is also xy equals 1. But look what happens when we multiply them together. I get little x squared minus little y squared because we've got difference of two squares on the top. But I know what little x squared minus little y squared is. Because we go back to the original hyperbola, it had the equation little x squared minus little y squared was equal to a squared. And so there we have it. x times y is equal to a constant. There's our rectangular hyperbola in the form that we're used to seeing. x times y is equal to a constant. Okay, what's the focus? Well, we know originally the focus was plus or minus ae0. It's going to become plus or minus root 2 a0. But if I multiply, because we're rotating it, 45 degrees, if I multiply that by 1 on root 2 plus 1 on root 2i, I get a plus ai, so it works out very nice that the focus is simply the point ai. 
directrix was plus or minus a on e. Now we've got to think a little bit more about this one. So a, I'm sorry, e is the square root of 2. So x equals plus or minus a on the square root of 2. Originally, the directrices are parallel to the y-axis. So if I'm rotating them 45 degrees anti-clockwise, they'll become parallel to y equals negative x. So I know the, the slope of the new directrices. I know, therefore, the equation of it will be x plus y plus some constant value is equal to zero. Okay. But I also know the distance between the directrices. Because remember, we said it was a on root 2. So a on root 2 to minus a on root 2. Now, when I rotate it, that distance doesn't change. That's still going to be the same. So the distance from the origin would be half that. So I know the distance from the origin to this line, x plus y plus k equals 0, is a on root 2. So I can now work out k by using the perpendicular distance formula. 0 plus 0 plus k, because I'm saying, hey, 0, 0, the origin to the line. Uh, and we simply get that, uh, well, k is plus or minus a. So the two directrices are x plus y equals plus or minus a. Okay, so here's our definitions. Again, sort of thing that probably not going to ask us to derive. We can just, you know, just like we did with the other ones where we could say, hey, focus is AE0. For this one, we can say, oh, well, the focus is AA and so on. So, rectangular hyperbola, once it has been rotated into its traditional format, we have the general equation XY equals a half A squared. Once we've got it in that form, we can work out A. We know the foci will then be at plus or minus A, plus or minus A. That's not implying four points, by the way. I suppose that's a bad way of writing it because it sort of means there's four points. It means AA minus A minus A because the foci lies on the line Y equals X. Directrices will be X plus Y equals plus or minus A. Eccentricity is always the square root of 2. Parametric coordinates. Now, when we do the parametric coordinates, we don't worry about the half A squared. We simply say it's equal to some constant squared. So C squared. It makes the parameters very simple. These parametrics are more like, I guess, the parabola ones that we saw, where we just do it in terms of T. So some number as we're going along. And we simply say, well, X is C times T. Y is C divided by T. So when you multiply them together, you get c squared. The tangents, when you work it out, ends up being something like this. x plus t squared y is equal to 2ct. <coughs> and the normal, beautiful looking expression there, t cubed x minus ty is equal to c outside of t to the power of 4 minus 1. Again, sort of thing you're probably going to have to derive anyway. Let's have a look at a very symmetric question. Seeing we're talking about the hyperbola, which is a wonderful symmetric shape. 1991, beautiful symmetric year. Reads the same backwards and forwards. Hyperbola H is XY equals 4, they told us this particular year. The first question was simply, a bit of a gift, sketch H, showing where H intersects the axis of symmetry. Oh, okay. Well, there, there's my hyperbola. It intersects on the line y equals x, the axis of symmetry. Well, it must be at the point 2, 2. But if we were unsure, we could go and do a little equation there and go, well, x times y is equal to 4. y is equal to x, so x squared is 4. Ah, oh, x is plus or minus 2. So they're the point 2, 2 and minus 2, minus 2. And then we said, thank you very much for that question. We appreciate those marks. Part B then show that the tangent is this particular expression. So we're using our parametric coordinates. In this case, because remember, xy equals c squared when we're thinking about the parameter. So c would be 2. So our parametrics are 2t, two 2t. Two uh, we've got to find the slope. So I differentiate. I get minus 4 and x squared. At the point where x equals 2t, that slope is minus 1 on t squared. Put it into the point slope formula, y minus y1 equals m outside of x minus x1. Rearranging it, and 
Whilst it is unusual to write the equation of a line like that, normally we do it as y equals mx plus b or general, that's how they've asked us to show it, so I'll write it down that way. x plus t squared y is equal to 4t. Hmm. S can't equal 0. That makes sense, because if you have a look at the point q, s is on the bottom of a fraction, so it can't be 0. S squared does not equal t squared. Uh, what's that mean? Well, remember P was 2T, 2 on T. So we're saying uh, P and Q can't be the same point, but it's also saying they can't be uh, diagonally opposite, I guess, isn't it? Because it's saying T can't equal negative S and S and so on. We're going to show that the tangents at these two points intersect at 4ST on S plus T, 4 over S plus T. Okay, we just showed that the tangent at P is x plus t squared y equals 4t. I'm not going to re-derive that, remember, is the whole point of parametrics. Once I've got a form in parametrics, I don't need to redo it. If that's the equation of the tangent when the parameter is t, then that x plus s squared y equals 4s must be the equation of the tangent when the parameter is s. There's our two tangents. We want to find the point of intersection. Well, coefficient of x is already the same. So let's subtract t squared minus s squared, difference of two squares. So the uh, t minus s will cancel, and we end up with y equals 4 on s plus t, which is what we want. Now, because this is a show that question, I can't just go, oh, and therefore x is this. I've actually got to show that's the x value. So I do my substitution, x plus 4t squared on s plus t is 4t, rearrange that, and sure enough, we get x is... 4st on s plus t. So yes, m is that particular point. The other way I suppose I could do that is because it is a show that question, I could substitute m into p and show yes it lies on p. I could substitute it into q and go oh yes it lies on q as well, therefore that must be the point of intersection. Suppose that s is equal to minus 1 on t. Show that the locus of M, so here comes that end point, the locus question, is a straight line through the origin, but not including the origin. So there is a restriction on it. We just found X was 4ST on S plus T. Y is 4 over S plus T. We need to eliminate the parameters, get a relationship between X and Y. They've told us S is equal to minus 1 on T. So there's a connection we can use. So if s is equal to minus 1 on t, another way of saying that is st is negative 1. I'm going to substitute that into the x, and I get minus 4 on s plus t. I now don't have to worry about the s plus t, because it's the denominator in both, and we can clearly see that y is the negative of x. So y is equal to 4 on s plus t, which is the negative x. There is our locus, so it is a straight line through the origin. But there was one other part. The restriction was, but not including the origin. Well, 4 on s plus t can't equal 0. Because you've got a constant on the top of the fraction. So therefore, you could never get the possibility of naught naught for this particular one. So, excluding the point, naught naught. Uh, you might be thinking, that's a funny-looking rectangular hyperbola. And you'd be right, that is a funny-looking rectangular hyperbola. It's actually an ellipse, for those that haven't noticed. Uh, but I've just added this in because it is a classic question, and it illustrates an easy way of, of sometimes doing these things. Show that PS plus PS dash, so the sum of the focal lengths of an ellipse, is always equal to 2A. Now, I could get the... Uh, Point S is AE0. This is minus AE0. I could play with the distance formulas and do all that. There is, of course, an easier way. It's always much easier to find a horizontal or a vertical length than a, a length of something at an angle. We can use our definition of an ellipse. PS plus PS dash will equal the eccentricity times PM. Remember, distance to the focus is equal to eccentricity times the distance to the directrix, plus, to the other directrix, eccentricity times pm dash. 
I can factorize that and get PM plus PM dash, which is just a horizontal line going between the two directrices. Therefore, I know that distance is twice A over E. So E times 2A over E, the answer is 2A. Lot quicker than using the distance formula and, and trying to work it out the other way. Okay, let's play with 6D.